Okay, coming up on this edition of the Penn State Blitz, we've got some news on Cam Brown and Shaka Tony. Penn State's finally got its new offensive line coach. Talk a little bit about former Penn Staters, Joe Moorhead and Matt Rule. And we're going to close, as always, with the Penn State mailbag. Okay, Greg, we have a little bit of news on Shaka Tony, but not the news that Penn State fans kind of really want to have. He turned 22. Yes. So happy birthday to Shaka. Penn State's, well, he just completed his fourth year as a defensive end. Very good year. All Big Ten choice, I believe, second team. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's start with him, but he has still not made up his mind, Greg, about what he's going to do in 2020. The fact that this has kind of taken so long, has that kind of changed your opinion maybe about Shaka uh, and what he might do, or do you think he's really conflicted? I think at this point that he'll make a decision as soon as we stop taping this. (laughs) I get that feeling that that's the way this is going to go. But, uh, yeah, as of Wednesday morning, no announcement yet. (laughs) To me, so he has until January 20th. That's when the declaration day is to declare for the NFL draft. We can assume that he was one of Penn State's five selected players to get uh, feedback from the draft advisory board. So the question just becomes – does he want to hold out until the 20th to make a decision? Keep in mind, classes start next Monday, the same day as the national championship game. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think he has to decide by then. Right. I can't tell if he's conflicted, if he's just waiting for something, you know, in particular. He's been active on social media with, you know, sharing stuff about Miles Sanders and some other mm-hmm. guys that he knew from Philadelphia or his time at Penn State. So, you know, it's not like he took a vacation or anything like that. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure at this point. I guess my gut says he's going to go, Bob, but it's really hard to say. To me, I just don't know what areas he can take another step forward in. I think he'll get more attention next year. Maybe that would be detrimental to his stats with Etor Mm -hmm. Grossmatos gone. But either way, um, he is certainly in no rush to decide. Yeah, it's funny because when 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 you're around Shaka Tony a little bit, he's not a guy that really – craves the spotlight right. or the limelight. He maybe very that's much, why. He yeah. keeps to himself. So you, But the longer this goes on, the more he kind of becomes a little bit more of a story. And the closer we get to the cutoff date to declare or yeah. stay, it's almost he's going to become a bigger story. Yep. Uh, I don't know what to make. I thought for sure within a couple of days of the Cotton Bowl, he was going to make an announcement. And I really thought it was, I thought it was a, uh, a slam dunk he was going to leave. Now I'm not so sure. I agree with you. He'll be a marked man in 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a very good year. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. But let's turn our attention to a Penn State uh, upperclassman who definitely will not be back. Cam Brown, yep, who only had four years at Penn State, no red shirt, outside linebacker, very athletic guy, mm-hmm. freakishly athletic, 6'5", 230, 233. Um, Got a, uh, accepted a Senior Bowl invite. So mm-hmm. he'll be in the game later this month in Mobile, Alabama. Robert Windsor, Penn State senior defensive tackle, is down there as well. When you look at those two players, Greg, and the thing with the Senior Bowl is it's really not about the game. No. It's about the week of practice and, get, and the coaches getting a closer look at what you're good at, what you're not good at, and kind of kind of pigeonholing what you, may be, you might be able to do at the next level. When you look at these two players, who do you think has more to prove? Well, I think both of them, really. But to me, it's probably Cam Brown just because he – I think he played with more weight in 2019 than he did in any previous season at Penn State. But I still Mm -hmm. wonder if NFL teams maybe don't know exactly what to do with a guy who's 6'5", 235. Mm -hmm. Um, He has some great tape for Penn State, there's no doubt. But to me, I think he can showcase – how high his ceiling is. With Windsor, I think you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a guy who's very technically sound. He can eat up space if you ask him to. He can rush the passer if you ask him to. I'm not saying he has nothing to prove, but I think Mm -hmm. analysts and evaluators know what they're getting with him. I think with Cam Brown, maybe they can, he can showcase some things that people haven't seen before. Yeah. A couple things about Cam. If, if, if he, if you're an NFL team and you're interested in drafting him, I think he would be a core special teams player, something he was very good at at Penn mm-hmm. State. You're right about the – it's hard to project him. I mean, he played outside linebacker at Penn State. James Franklin talked about maybe they, uh, he could have been a defensive end as well. He certainly has the frame to be one, but yeah. he never really did that at Penn State. He wasn't really great uh, maybe at rushing the passer. I thought he was going to take – Another step this year. His year this year looked a lot like last year to me. Mm-hmm. Um, what I remember about him is he was in position to make a ton of plays 
in 2019. He played hard on every snap, Greg, but he missed some tackles. Yeah. He didn't always make those plays. Um, I wonder maybe if he, he can get better. I think he can. <clears throat> but I, I think I look at him as a guy that if he's gonna if he goes to the combine, he should test very well. But he's a little bit of a project, a little bit rough around the edges, mm-hmm. and it is hard to kind of figure out is he really an outside linebacker in the four three? Yeah. Would you look at him as a three four if you get him up to two forty, two forty five? But I think he can do a lot of little things that would help a team. I do agree with you, Greg. I think he is the guy that probably has a little bit more to prove, but he's only gotta really wow a couple of teams to get some notice i think for the draft yeah and let's not forget that even if the senior bowl maybe doesn't go exactly as planned i mean how many penn state guys have gone to the combine and become workout darlings and that's led to right. them being drafted i mean troy apke is the one that everyone points to but yeah. you know every year it's either rich eisen or mike mayock before he went to the raiders or daniel jeremiah or one of the espn guys that say you know that Dwight Galt, he really knows how to train these Penn State players right. to get ready for the combine. I know a lot of them leave Penn State to go train elsewhere um, before they head to Indianapolis. But you know, even if the Senior Bowl doesn't go necessarily as planned, the combine can always be a second proving ground for a guy like Cam Brown. Okay, let's get to James Franklin's newly fleshed out uh, coaching staff. We hope there's no more defections wouldn't or changes. Think so. Wouldn't think so for tw- for 2020. Um, you know, he got Kirk Soraka to be the uh, the offensive coordinator when Ricky Ronnie took the ODU job, but he also didn't. They didn't retain Matt Limegrover, who had been with Penn State as the offensive line coach for four years. Yep. It didn't. I don't think it took all that long. It's, which speaks to the fact that he probably knew that this was going to be his guy. Phil Troutline, Boston College. Yep. Uh, if, if you if the Penn State fan base was kind of following along on social media, a lot of praise and a lot of people that really liked the hire. When you look at Phil Troutline. Um, what would you say jumps out to you, Greg, and what do you think he can do for this offensive line? Well, I think the big thing was you look at his Boston College line and the advanced statistics were very good. And then some people were maybe, I don't want to say uh, taking some credit away from those stats, but saying that, well, he had some veteran starters, mm-hmm. well, he had a very good offensive line, well, they ran the ball a lot, so that played a role. You can say all those things and that's fine, but he's coming to a place where the offense is very good. They're going to have veteran offensive linemen, mm-hmm. and they have six good running backs. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't know yeah. if any of them necessarily quite at A.J. Dillon's level yet, but, you know, he's coming into a situation that he's going to be uh, in position to elevate some veterans and bring along some younger guys. He has a great track record when it comes to all-conference and all. I believe he had one All-American at Boston College. Mm-hmm. Uh, he played the position at a high level when he was at college mm-hmm. in Florida. So you put all those things together, and I think you get a winner. With a proven recruiting background, let's not forget that Boston College's top two signees in December were four-star offensive tackles. Yeah. They've signed, so Penn State cannot flip them at this point unless you know something crazy would happen and Boston College would release them, which not which is not going to happen. Uh, so you know, I think that he and he recruits Louisiana, Texas, Georgia, some southern states that Penn State's been able to get into, but maybe not with great regularity. So. Two and two equals four on this one. He can develop offensive linemen and he can yeah. recruit. So when you look for what James Franklin's looking for, those two boxes must be checked. Yeah, and don't – I think you're touching on the recruiting aspect. I think that is very much of a, a key in James Franklin's mind as he continues to expand Penn State's recruiting footprint out of, you know, the northeast. Yeah. You know, he's, he's dipped into the south. He's dipped into Texas with some great success. There's some pretty nice athletes, offensive linemen in the South. When you're trying to block the Michigan and Ohio State defensive fronts, the more big athletes you can have, yeah. the better your chances. I'm curious to see what he'll do with the current offensive line, which looks to be a strength. But I'm also, I think, the next couple of recruiting cycles with him seeing what they can do, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. Um, he's a current coach for the Penn State. Uh, Staff, let's talk about a couple of former, one a former Penn State player uh, and one former Penn State coach. Let's start with Joe Moorhead. You know, two and out, I think, at Mississippi State as the offensive coach, Penn State's former offensive coordinator, looking for work as we talk about this. Uh, it didn't, it's The rumblings were not good about some off-the-field issues, yeah. I think, at Mississippi State. Do you think that was what ultimately led to the, the, the shortened career for him? Or do you think it was – you know, they just didn't do very well in two years they against did. some very good SEC teams. They didn't do very well against, but I, I just don't really. Uh, two years at that place is yeah. almost impossible. I mean, it's yeah. asking for the impossible 
Did they have some off-field issues? Sure. Um, were there some academic things going on that I think are going to come out in the future about where this program was from that side of things? Yeah. <laughs> um, but do I think they're probably as bad as what they've been made out to be? No. I think that was probably intentionally leaked that way to make it look like getting rid of Joe Moorhead was the right decision. Maybe right. it was. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Um, I understand why he left Penn State to take that job, but – it was always going to be a struggle, yeah. And he was going to have to be accepted in a place that he's never worked or coached or lived before. And I don't think that ever took place. So, to me, he's going to come back to the Northeast, be an offensive coordinator for a couple of years again, and after that, probably go back to being a head coach. But maybe he wasn't quite as ready as at least I thought he was for that jump to a major, uh, the head coach of a major yeah. college football program. I mean, it's one thing to to lead Fordham for as long as he did. It's another thing to be a two-year offensive coordinator at Penn State mm -hmm. and be as successful as he was. It's another thing to go to a part of the country you've never recruited in and be a full-time leader of an SEC program. Oh, and get beat up by the Alabamas of yeah. the world uh, every year. So, uh, unfortunate. I think there's a lot of people that like Joe Moorhead. I think sure. have no problem finding a job. But when you look back on it with the, uh, the 2020 hindsight, it – probably isn't all that much of a surprise yeah northeast midwest he seems like that kind of guy but you're right he's a pittsburgh guy growing up did some really good things in 2016 and 2017 yeah. with his rpo trace mcsorley mm -hmm. saquon barkley mike gasicki deshaun hamilton chris godwin i think for a year so let's hope he lands on his feet quickly i'm sure that he will yeah he certainly is one of the better offensive minds in all of college football. I think Penn State's lucky he didn't end up at Rutgers. And ultimately, ultimately, I think that maybe it'll be a learning experience for him for what he, from what happened at Mississippi State. Also, uh, Bob Shoup was his DC. Yeah, former where Penn does he State end up? DC as well. Bob Shoup lands on his feet too, but he's he's coached a lot of places. Uh, you know, even before he came, even before he got to Penn State, he seems like every eighteen months. Yeah, he has the itch to uh, to either move or renegotiate. So uh, good luck to, to Coach Moorhead. He's always been good to the media. Uh, great quote, uh, Matt Rule. We didn't we haven't we didn't really ever get a chance to really deal much with him. What I remember about Matt Rule, the former Baylor coach, is who is now the Carolina Panthers head coach, is when he was at Temple in 2015, I believe. Yep. He was the guy that put it on Penn State and James Franklin in that 27-10 game yeah. at the link. They sacked Christian Hackenberg, I think, 10, ten times, times in that yep. game. He used that job, I think, as a, as a stepping point, a, a stepping stone, excuse me, to get to Baylor. He actually did some really good things at Baylor in a couple of years, got them going. And sure now did. it's a big jump to the NFL, and he's getting paid very well to coach in Carolina. What do you make of this move, and do you think he's ready to be an NFL head coach? I do. I think he's had success everywhere he went, so why would this be any different? The biggest thing, of course, is that you know, you're no longer recruiting guys into your program. They're there making money, and you know how you put them in position to succeed uh, will ultimately define how much they respect you, how much they want to play for you, so on and so forth. So uh, he was always trending this way. He's been linked to NFL yeah. jobs before. Unlike James Franklin, he's never felt like a, lo a lifer in college football. I think James Franklin, you know, there was that point in time when he was linked to the Redskins job and a couple other NFL jobs. To me, James Franklin's a college football lifer. Matt Rule, clearly I don't think had those intentions, yeah. but um, he did a great job at Temple. You mentioned the great job he did at Baylor. So mm -hmm. the signs were certainly pointing to uh, him landing an NFL job, and he was clearly coveted. You know, the Giants were interested. The uh, Panthers were interested. So he lands in Carolina. Good for him. And uh, one other former staffer note, Ted Roof, the longtime Teddy uh, Roof, Billy O'Brien's first defense coordinator. Yeah, now the, Va now the Vanderbilt defensive coordinator. <laughs> so how about that? Previous institution and current institution. Yeah. Um, previous, yeah, we'll get it. You, you know where I'm going with that. But yeah. So a lot of movement on the carousel for people connected to Penn yeah. State this offseason. I love your use of the word coveted. I think it's coveted, but we're, that's, yeah, that's, that's okay. okay. Um, it's a middle town Matt, thing. <laughs> Matt Rule, we should point out, was a former Penn State player. Um, I don't. I, was he a grad assistant at Penn State at I one point? I believe he was. So yeah. yeah, that's the connection. That's the connection to Penn State. Before we get to the mailbag and your championship game pick, though, I think you have a little so, some chores to do. Yeah, let's not forget the Penn State Blitz, except for holidays and other select occasions, is uh, out Thursday mornings on Penn Live mm -hmm. and wherever you get your audio. Uh, don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, and. Uh, Leave some comments. Leave some feedback. We'll also uh, have the video versions available at youtube.com slash State, And you can find those, at, of course, at penlive.com as well. Awesome. Time for the Penn State mailbag. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to mess around. 
We got January 13th, which is this next Monday, Monday mm-hmm. in the Superdome. The Saints won't be playing there after that uh, disappointing effort against the Vikings, Boy, although you took advantage of it. I did. That in Illinois basketball, but that's another story. <laughs> let's let's just get to it. It's it's LSU and Clemson. Clemson beat Ohio State in a great game. LSU just walked all over Oklahoma in the two semifinals. I think the line was approaching six last time I looked at it. I don't know where it is now, Greg, but as you look at this game, which is essentially – in LSU's backyard, two unbeaten teams, mm-hmm. defending national champion Clemson's an underdog. Uh, how do you see it, and what's your pick? Yeah, so five and a half is what it was last I saw. I I don't think they wanted to get to six because they had so many look-ahead lines that had this game near pick, and they don't want to get middled. So to me, I think they'll keep it. You and your terminology. I know, but to me, so it stays around five and a half. Maybe it gets to six, it gets knocked back down. The interesting thing to me about this game, Bob, I don't know what you've heard, but from the people I've listened to, yeah. there's – Everyone is dug in on their opinion. I guess that's what happens sure. when there's 15 days between the playoff and the mm-hmm. championship game. But, you know, I heard a couple people say LSU doesn't belong on the same field as Clemson. I've heard it the other way around. So, to me, I think <laughs> LSU does win the game. I think Clemson covers. I, it's a field goal game to me. It really is. I think it's going to be a classic. I hope it is anyway because we've waited long enough to see it. So, I, you know, score-wise, haven't given it too much thought, but – I think LSU wins, Clemson covers by, you know, a couple of points. Yeah, to me, I, I really like that total in this game. I don't care if it's 65, 7, whatever it is. 105. No, there's no weather. Uh, weather will not be an issue. Wind will not be an issue. Uh, both teams have explosive athletes just all over the place. Clemson has shown in most of their title game appearances they're not scared. Um, they scored on some very good defenses, some very good Alabama defenses. Yep. They have a, a tremendous player in that quarterback. They got skill at running back. They got skill at the wide out position. And LSU's passing game, no one, not LSU's offense, no one stopped it all year. I think Clemson plays some pretty good defense. Mm-hmm. I just think in a dome, the way that Burrow is playing. I'm not sure who wins the game, Greg. I just think the game's going to be played in the high 30s, maybe in the 40s. It just feels to me like it's a track meet. Um, and I don't think you're going to see a lot of three and outs. I like that pick more than maybe trying to take a side. Clemson very well might have the heart to kind of beat an LSU team. I think that top to bottom is a little bit more talented. Mm-hmm. But Clemson is, is used to the big game environment. I don't know that Eddie O is. I know Dabo is. Right. So my pick would be to go over whatever that is. I just I just think that that's, that's a pretty easy bet. Unlike my, I like the Penn State Cotton Bowl to go under, and I was way wrong on that. I think it could be a similar type of game. I really do think you'll see – you know, 75, 80 points on the board, but I've been wrong before. All right, so Clemson and the over, we'll tease those two together. I got one question for you before we get out of here. Super. What happens first? Shaka Tony makes his announcement, or we receive the basic terms of James Franklin's contract? <laughs> I was asked the other day why the media cares so much <laughs> Sounds about— Sounds like it's bugging you. It is. I, and I was asked the other day why the media cares so much about James Franklin's basic terms. Yeah. It's well. There's two things. Number one, to be able to put it in, you know, because Sandy Barber at uh, out the Cotton Bowl mm-hmm. sort of took exception to the fact that sometimes Brent Pry's salary is noted from the USA Today coaches salary database, and that it's wrong, even though they don't really want to update that. Mm-hmm. So they will update James Franklin's terms eventually. But I'm curious from two reasons, perspectives: the buyout, and also because the highest paid uh, state employee in Pennsylvania's contract should be public. So, yeah. um, well, they'll get around to it at some point, but. It wasn't really a oh, question. It's gonna be, it's it's gonna be of, Shaka. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it probably sure. will be Shaka. Yeah, uh, that sounds about right. All right, should we get into uh, the second video in the back half of the Blitz? It sounds like a great idea to me.